Okay. Okay. Tonight, I'm going to take you on an overview of the Pope's visit to Israel. And perhaps the overview that I will give you is not one that most would expect. In one way, I would say that I do not want to spiritualize what his visit implies, what he did, what he said, where he went. But yet at the same token, there's a lot of spiritualism that surrounds his trip in the first place. Pope Francis, when he came to Israel, it was a political stunt from the beginning to the end. And of course, he did achieve, I believe, what he intended to achieve, and that was to gain the support of the people, both Jewish and Palestinian peoples alike. And he managed to get a much larger following in the process. Although he did snub the Israeli people in his visit when he flew from Jordan to Bethlehem, sidestepping Israel altogether. But it didn't seem to stop his momentum as he slanted the Israeli people, as he gave, what would you say, honor to the Palestinians and to give credence to their desire to be a state and declaring that they were a state. It's interesting as we see in the images as he visited uh, Israel, both in the West Bank <clears throat> and in even the state of Israel itself, everywhere you would look in the pictures, I noticed that the people, the children especially, the Palestinian children as well as Israeli children, holding Vatican flags, the double key flag that represents his authority, both in spiritual matters as well as in political, showing that he is the king of the world as well as the head of all religions. And yet both of these groups were touting his flag all over the place. And of course the media made sure that the world was able to see this. And as I begin to look at where all the Pope actually visited, we see that, you know, once he had made all of his connections with the, with the Muslim world, uh, including having a, a mass at the Jordan River, at a church at the Jordan River, not now at the typical site where the Israelis have, which is near, near uh, Lake Kinneret or the Sea of Galilee, but at a Muslim church. Uh, that is uh, controlled by the Arabs. And then, of course, as I said, he goes into Bethlehem as he, when he flies into Bethlehem. Uh, on his way to do a mass there, he stops, as they say, it was, it was not planned or staged, but there's no doubt that his stop at the part of the security fence that protects Israel from all the um, suicide uh, bombers and attacks on Israeli citizens, you have to understand Jerusalem and Bethlehem are very close together. If there's not a security fence there, it just opens the door for endless attacks on Israel. Makes it so much easier because the way the West Bank is laid out in Jerusalem as it comes in, it's like a little finger that just comes right in uh, from Tel Aviv. And so there's not much of a buffer for the Jewish people anywhere to be protected from Palestinians that have nothing but a desire to totally wipe out and destroy Israel. In fact, now that we have the unity government, Hamas, with the Palestinians uh, or the PA authority, this is, a, this is a group that is bent in their charter. Look it up on Wikipedia. They are determined to annihilate the Jewish people. But he stops at this one place at the wall where it says there, free Palestine. And it also likens Bethlehem to the ghettos of Warsaw. Well, believe me, the ghettos of Warsaw were much more deplorable. At least Bethlehem is not a deplorable city. It's a city to where they have shops and everything, normalcy. In fact, one thing that I was thinking about, especially in light of the fact as we are here, we're, this, uh, Shavuot is ending, and we read the book of Ruth, and we see that Ruth comes home to Israel, and it's to Bethlehem. Why are we not taking back what belongs to Israel? 
But yet, more and more, everything is handed over to the Palestinians. Something is seriously wrong. I know that also Naftali Bennett met with the Pope as well during his trip. I hope, as he has done many times, publicly speaking, his stand against the Palestinian people and believing to annex large portions of the West Bank, I hope he had the audacity to tell the Pope just exactly that. In fact, one thing that really kind of troubled me is when Benjamin Netanyahu, in a statement to the Pope, and you can see this for yourself. In fact, I'll, I'll play it in just a moment for you. But he's telling the Pope in Hebrew that this was the land where Jesus was from and that Jesus spoke Hebrew. And then we see the Pope correct the Prime Minister of Israel, and says, Aramaic. And instead of, the, uh, uh, of Benjamin Netanyahu standing his ground, he simply says, he agrees Aramaic, but he says he knew Hebrew. He didn't know all languages, but the mere fact, and this has been hidden by the Vatican down through the ages. Why? Because they've wanted to annihilate the Jews. They want nothing, they want no one to know anything about the apostles and their Hebraic roots. But there still are ancient manuscripts of Matthew's writings, and they're in Hebrew. And I would bet anything that you'd wanna, of course, you can't gamble, but if I could gamble, I would say one thing for sure. I'm sure we'll find a lot more of these scripts if we could find some of the ancient ones are written in Hebrew, especially Paul. If Paul took the time, as the scripture says, he beckoned to the Jews in the Hebrew tongue and they listened all the more earnestly, do you not think that Paul wouldn't have written in the Hebrew tongue as well? So I would, I would, Prime Minister, you should have stood your ground and say, I appreciate that you think it was Aramaic, but he spoke Hebrew. I know, though, he's the world dignitary, the leader of the world, and he lavishes money wherever he wants to lavish it. And, you know, we can tell right there at the, um, the new shopping center just outside of Jaffa Gate there. Yeah, the money must have come from the Vatican. Why else would they have a huge Catholic church built right in the center of it? For all the Jews, as we walk down through this nice, beautiful shopping center to look up to see a statue of Mary at the top. It's just kind of ironic, isn't it? Anyway, so as the Pope makes his visit there, uh, as I said, he was in Bethlehem. He stops at the, at the, at the uh, security fence, and the images are, are there. Uh, this was on his way to do a Mass. After he does the Mass in Bethlehem, this is when the Pope invites Shimon Peres, the President of Israel, and Mahmoud Abbas back to Rome in June. For what? A prayer meeting, nonetheless. The, the ironic thing is, of course, they both accept. Now, I shouldn't really expect anything different from Shimon Perez. After all, he is a son of Ahab. And God will take and bring the judgment upon Ahab's son for the evils that Ahab did. Because at least Ahab had enough sense to repent. And even though he married Jezebel, he still had enough sense to repent. Unfortunately, Shimon Perez has married Jezebel, the Vatican in this case. And he doesn't have enough sense to repent. Um, also in the Pope's trip, he actually, um, one of the things that was kind of interesting is he made sure that part of his delegation for the trip, and both men were from Argentina, is he has a rabbi named Abraham uh, Sikorka and a Muslim leader from Argentina, Omar Aboud, who are part of his delegation to show unity of faith. And this rabbi, Abraham Skorka, he just really just throws himself all out for the Pope, makes the Pope look like this great peacemaker. Uh, and it's kind of interesting, even the, the banners all over Israel, in fact, right before we came back to the United States here for a couple of months, uh, the, the, the banners were already going up. I photographed some of them there. And they're always putting this dove in there, the, which is a sign of peace. 
they, I mean, they really are trying to make the Pope look like as if he were Yeshua coming in to Israel, or Yahshua, Jesus, that is. And, and I'm just, I'm taken back by it, needless to say. Um, but we know, though, that the Antichrist, I know a lot of people, you know, some people say, oh, I believe the Pope is a false prophet. Well, I believe he's a false prophet as well, you know. But you have to understand the Antichrist is, 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 we see, you know, we know the scripture says the Antichrist spirit even now is, as, as it was written back um, in the biblical time, but it's always come up. And this is what we see through the Vatican. But we have to remember, the beast is the Antichrist system, and that's the Vatican that, co that's, that comes up out of the water. But then there is a beast that comes up out of the earth, which is the clay, which is the man. This is your false prophet. And it's kind of ironic. I, I know uh, Brother Rob Conrad, I like the way he puts it. When John is writing about it in the epistles there, he writes about the Antichrist, but he says when he goes into Revelation, it's like he gets a little bit better look at who this man is. That's when he writes about him as a false prophet. And we've spoken about this many times, Antichrist, Antichristo, as it is in the Greek language there, which is a substitute for Christ. This is exactly what the Pope is being portrayed as to the Jewish people, to the Muslim people, and everywhere. And of course, as usual, the Pope did not refer to the state of Israel. But he did acknowledge that the Palestinians was a Palestinian state in his trip. He also made sure that he made amends with the Orthodox Church while he was there. It was very interesting, the unity that he was trying to build with the religions of the world. And in fact, that only stands to reason that all the churches and all the religions of the world, because she is called in the book of Revelation, the Christian Bible, the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The Muslim religion is the abominations. And of course, the great harlots who come back home to their mother are the denominational systems. They're not Every church, not every leader, not every pastor will go along with this. We know that. There are still true men and women of God that recognize that the Vatican is on a mission from hell. And they won't be a part of all this. But unfortunately, there is a lot more that have no idea whatsoever about what's going on. You know, another thing that was interesting in Pope Francis's visit, once he finishes with the Palestinians, placing them first, of course, and it's kind of interesting, you see all these photos with the Pope with Mahmoud Abbas, and he's marching him or bringing him in front of his Palestinian military. I thought that was kind of interesting. That's to show, that's to declare that he's a state, because they always, when world leaders come, they like to show off their military if you're a bona fide state. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But you know, Pope Francis, he did take and deviate from what Pope John Paul did back in 2000 when he came to Israel. In fact, when he came to Israel, he actually placed a note at the Wailing Wall that asked for forgiveness for, as he put it, for sufferings inflicted on the Jews by Christians. It's kind of interesting, he does sidestep the murders that were done by Christians. He just called it sufferings. But at least he said a little bit closer to what the Jewish people could appreciate. And Pope Francis, when he visited, he did go to, um, he, did, he went to a memorial that had been, uh, that was made for Israeli victims of suicide bombers. Um, he also visited and laid a wreath at uh, Theodore Herzl's uh, tomb uh, with uh, Shimon Peres and Prime Minister Netanyahu at his side. Uh, and then he went to the Wailing Wall. And of course, his beloved friend, Rabbi 
Abraham uh, Skorka was there with him, who he gives a great big hug after he prays for a few moments and places a, a uh, note in the wall himself. And in his note, he is praying for the peace of these two of these areas here. Um, he also stated in his in his trip, the solution for two states should become a reality and not remain just a dream. Um, at any rate, let me just share something with you. As I look at all of this and I see the events that took place, many, many, by the way, many rabbis came out in support of the Pope's visit, at least publicly, that's what they show us. I know that there are some genuine rabbis that oppose his visit. There were mass protests by the Orthodox Jewish community at King David's tomb before his visit, but they made sure that there were no Jews whatsoever at the tomb of David when Pope Francis come to see the upper room. So there were some true Jews that were there. And I wanted to just share with you two different scriptures in summarizing what I see with the Pope's visit. One is actually found in the book of Revelation, chapter 14. And let me just start with verse 3 and read verse 3 and verse 4. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the beast and elders. And no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty uh, and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which followed the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. <clears throat> These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now it's kind of interesting that the scripture calls the 144,000, which we do read earlier in Revelation chapter 11, that there were sealed 12,000 from each tribe, of the tribes of Israel, and totaling of 144,000. And sometimes people mistakenly say that these are all men because they are called virgins. But in reality, I think that the reason why they're called virgins is because they did not get tied up with the religious systems of the hour that we're living in. They, unlike Rabbi Abraham Korka, unlike other rabbis that have just really sucked up to the Pope and to the Vatican agenda, these are men and women that have stayed separated. Now, I say this, I've had different opinions on this. I know some people believe that uh, the 144,000 are only men, and of course they cite that because they say they're virgins. But like I said, the virginity part is only showing they're not tied up with this church systems or any of the religious organizations whatsoever. Uh, but it does call them the first fruits, which does that mean it's just the remnant that are saved? Well, according to Revelation 11, it does tell us that they're sealed 144,000, the sealing being the Holy Ghost. But another thing that it brings to mind, and I've spoke to you guys about this before, and this is where Ezra speaks of what happened in his day at the building of the second temple. And here we are at a time frame where indeed we may see the third temple built. I really, though, had a lot of mixed emotions about this, as much as even when I had uh, an in-depth interview with Brother Rob Conrad, and we talked about how that the third temple would be built and that the Antichrist would desecrate this temple. But the more and more I see these things, I'm not really sure exactly what's going to happen or how it's going to happen. But nonetheless, there will be a third temple and there will be a sacrifice as it will be started because the Antichrist comes in and puts a stop to the sacrificial services. But let me just share with you something that happened when Ezra was getting ready to build the second temple. This is in chapter 9, 
and beginning in verse 1, says, Now when these things were done, the princess came to me saying, uh, let, me, let me back up just a little bit for you. Let's start with uh, chapter 8, verse 35. Also the children of those who had been carried away, who were come out of the exile, offered burnt offerings to, God, to the God of Israel. Twelve bullocks for all Israel, ninety-six rams, seventy-seven lambs, twelve he-goats for a sin offering. And all this was a burnt offering to the Lord. And they delivered the king's commission to the king's uh, satraps and the governors of this side of the river. And they furthered the people and the house of God. So they were beginning to get things going. Then this happens. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priest and the Levites, notice the people of Israel, the priest and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaani and the Hittite and the Perzai and the Yavusi and the uh, Ammoni and the Moabite and the Mizri and the Imori. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves, for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the princes and the rulers has been cheap in this crime. When I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down appalled. Then every one who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of this transgression of those who had been carried away gathered around me, and I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. Now, this is exactly what's happening over again. Here we are coming to the time when it looks like the third temple may be built. Now, we don't have a surety of this as of yet, other than the fact that we know the scripture says, according to Daniel, that the, that the sacrifice and oblation will be ceased. So clearly it seems to be that the temple will once again be built and that the sacrificial services will be reinstituted. But we're finding that in modern days, before the building of the third temple, before it can even commence, we're already seeing the sins that, were, that happened back in the time of Ezra at the building of the second temple are once again being repeated. Where the princes of Israel and the chief leaders among the priests and the Levites have married in to the daughters of Babylon. The nations mixing and mingling a sin that will not go unpunished. In fact, as we go further down into this, we find out this is what is said in verse 6. O oh my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face to thee, thy God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our guilt has mounted to the heavens since the days of our fathers. We have been exceedingly guilty to this day and our iniquities. We are kings and our priests have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands of the sword to captivity and to plundering and to utter shame as it is this day. And now for a little moment, grace has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant escape and to give us a secure anchorage in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were slaves, yet God did not forsake us in our slavery, but gave us grace in the sight of the kings of Paras, and to give us a reviving to set us up a house of our God and to repair its ruins and to give us a wall in Yehuda and Jerusalem. Notice a wall. Right now, that's all we have is a wall in Jerusalem. But did you notice what he's saying here? And I haven't finished. I want to read on and everything. He's relating to the fact that Israel has always sinned and all these sins of messing around and mingling with all these nations and all these ungodly things is what drove us into captivity. And then he's hearing the report that they're doing it again. 
And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by the servants of the prophet saying the land into which you go to possess it is unclean land through the uncleanness of the peoples of the lands with their abom you know of the peoples of the lands with their abominations for they have filled it from one end to the other with their uncleanliness now therefore do not give your daughters to their sons nor take their daughters to your sons nor seek their peace or their welfare forever do you think that god's commandment has changed o israel God says that these lands are unclean. And do not think that the Vatican is a Christian institution. It is a political power that is exercising authority over the world as their flag states, the Vatican flag, the two keys representing temporal and political powers. Or spiritual powers. Temporal being the, the political they intend to dominate the world. And he says right here clearly to us, Now therefore do not give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, nor seek their peace or their welfare forever. And what are we doing in Israel today? Do you not realize the reason we went into captivity back in the times of the Babylonians is because of this? And then in 70 AD, we go back into captivity again. Why? Because we, we rejected Yahshua to be the salvation to Israel. We did not, our forefathers did not want to believe that Jesus was indeed the Mashiach. And you go, when we go into captivity again, and then God finally brings us back home to our land. As, as Ezra is saying here, notice what he says here. For they, have, let's see, um, verse, verse 9, backing up a little bit. For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our slavery, but gave us a grace in the sight of the kings of of. Uh, Paris, or you know Persia that is to give us a reviving to set up the house of our God and to repair its ruins and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem and now our God what shall we say after this for we have forsaken thy commandments which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets do you not realize you know for one to invite the Pope into Israel is a sin to permit him to go and stand before the wailing wall. You don't think that when a third temple is built, you're not going to permit him in? In fact, not only will you permit him in, you'll make everybody leave. You know, it kind of makes me wonder, what does it mean when the scripture says the sac he'll put an end to the sacrifices and oblations? Is it because he comes to visit and he makes everything shut down? That may be how simple it is. I, I, I don't know. I can't say the answer to this things. All I can tell you is God says right here, and Ezra reminds us, and this is from the writings of the prophets, seek, nor seek their peace or their welfare forever. We don't need Vatican peace and we do not need their money. And yet you're doing both of it. This is what the trip of the Pope is all about. Do you not realize that Ezekiel says clearly in chapter 35 that he said within his heart, these two nations shall be mine? You don't think that the Palestinians are not a state already? Let me tell you something. When the Pope has already declared them to be a state and the United Nations has declared them to be a state, they're a state. The land is already divided. Don't think that it's not two states already. It is two states. You're just watching the little political maneuvering going on in the background. He goes on to say, And after all which has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that, God, that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this, should we again break 
thy commandments and make marriages with the peoples of these abominations, would thou not be angry with us until thou wouldest consume us, and so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? Have we not learned anything? You know, when Israel was in bondage with the Babylonians, it was only 70 years. They spent 2,000 years in captivity. Has Israel, have we not learned anything from these mistakes? No wonder why God has to bring two witnesses. Somebody's got to come in there and straighten out this mess because unfortunately God has brought our people back to their homeland but we're too ignorant to recognize God's word. The political leaders and many of the religious leaders are allowing abominations to come into Israel. Because why? Why? You know, man enough to stand up there and stand for God's word? What good does it do to read the Torah if you don't believe the Torah? With the peoples of these abominations, wouldst thou not be angry with us until thou wouldst consume us, that there should be no remnant nor escape? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as of this day. Behold, we are before thee in our guiltiness, but we cannot stand before thee because of this. Now, the beautiful thing about the story here in Ezra, the leaders that made these mistakes do end up repenting. And the only thing I can hope for at this moment is that God will do something speedily in Israel that will make our people to recognize the evils that we are doing and that we too will repent speedily because God is not going to play church with us. He's not going to play synagogue with us if we want to say it this way. I know in amongst Christianity it said God doesn't play church. In this case here, God is not going to play around and just, you know, he's, he's not here to play games. God has come to redeem us. And it's as if though we have learned nothing from our past, But he's about to do something. He is about to do something. I trust that this is a blessing to you in some way. If you want to be a part in supporting this ministry, we welcome and thank you for that. And we thank those that are a part of this ministry now. We've got to get the word out. I know as our website is growing, one of the things that we're doing, we have some brothers and sisters that will be writing in the website more frequently now that specifically have expertise in different areas. The Vatican being one of those uh, by a precious brother, Anthony Pope, that will be writing on that for us. Brother Gary Lowry will be writing as well on... Israeli military news, things that affect Israel from a military standpoint. My wife will be writing about cults as well as um, God's view on women. I want to stay focused in the identity of the Messiah that will help the Jewish people in whatever capacity He's called us in to recognize who Mashiach really is. And we thank you. We need your support in doing so. We love you. God bless you. Visit our website. In fact, there you're able to give. There's also our address under contacts if you prefer to, to, to mail a love offering in that manner. You can do that there as well. God bless you and good night. And I trust that God's speed and mercy will be upon you.